Hey friends! Uh, I'm trying to get more comfortable in front of the camera so I thought I would come on and show you the plethora of new books I got recently because I got so many new books. Uh, first let me, it says invite friends. Oh I can do that. Interesting. I don't think I've ever, I've only do like one Facebook live a year. Okay, I'm not going to invite people. Y'all can just jump in if you want to. Either way, uh, I got a shit ton of new books. Like, so many new books. And so I thought I would show them to you. Uh, I've been working a lot of overtime this month, so I rewarded myself by going on a book-buying binge. And then also I got sent some, and like, they've seriously been piling up like you wouldn't believe. But I'm very excited about them. So the first one I'll show you is called Cats I've Known, and it says on Cats I've Known on Love, Loss, and Being Graciously Ignored. If that's not the truth, I don't know what is. Oh, wait, people are talking to me. Hey, Harmony. Hey, Amy. Uh, it says... Also, it's... Can I just say it's hilarious that it's like blurb by Lil Bub, and I'm like... I see what you did there. Uh, so the description is, From deep friendships to brief encounters, this is the story of the cats in Katie Hagel's life, or rather the story of her life in relation to the many cats she meets in Philadelphia's streets, alleys, houses, apartments, and bookstores. Through Hagel's sharp, wise, and at times hilarious gaze, we see cats for what they truly are, minor deities that mostly ignore the human foibles being played out around them. They accept our offerings with equanimity and occasionally bestow some nice things on us. So as a cat lover, I was very, very excited about this one. I have uh, three devils that may make an appearance during this Facebook Live because they love to get in the way. Um, another new book, completely different genre, is The Butchering Art by Dr. Lindsay Fitzharris. Uh, she's a really hilarious, uh, Facebook, uh, sorry, Instagram follow if you like creepy, morbid stuff. So this is The Butchering Art, Joseph Lister's quest to transform the grisly world of Victorian medicine. Ooh. Uh, the description on this one is... In the butchering art, Lindsay Fitzharris reveals the shocking world of 19th century surgery on the eve of a profound transformation. As surgeons put on their blood-streaked aprons and align their instruments, hundreds of men would crowd into a dirty operating theater, ready to be enthralled by the spectacle. In a time before anesthesia, surgeons were lauded for their speed and brute strength. Surgery was a show. But no matter how quick the operation, the mortality rate for patients was just as high as ever. Surgeons were baffled by the mysterious ailments that claimed the lives of their patients until an unlikely figure stepped forward, a young, melancholy Quaker surgeon named Joseph Lister, who would solve the deadly riddle and change the course of history. Fitzharris dramatically reconstructs Lister's career path in gripping detail, culminating in his audacious claim that germs were the source of all infection and could be countered by antiseptics. Eerie and illuminating, the butchering art celebrates the triumph of a visionary surgeon whose quest to unite science and medicine delivered us into the modern world. Ooh, so there's that. It's kind of shocking to me that, like, there was just a period where you could just watch someone get surgery, like, without their consent, you know? Uh, like, I, I wouldn't be too thrilled if someone just, like, saw my innards. But, you know, different time. Okay. Uh, let's see here. While we're on about nonfiction... Oh, I should point out that when I say I got a bunch of new books, these are not necessarily newly published. They are just new to me, like new in my house. <laughs> um, so this one came out, I think, in the 90s, but it's called The Orchid Thief, A True Story of Beauty and Obsession by Susan Orlean. Uh, I recently read her book, The Library Book, which is about the fire at the Los Angeles Library. 
So I kind of got on a true crime kick and she's a super good writer. So the description on this one is a modern classic of professional journalism. The orchid thief is Susan Orleans wickedly funny, elegant and captivating tale of an amazing obsession. From Florida's swamps to its courtrooms, the New Yorker writer follows one deeply eccentric and oddly attractive man's possibly criminal pursuit of an endangered flower. Determined to clone the rare ghost orchid, Polyhysera lindenae, Latin, I don't speak that, uh, John LaRoche leads Orlean on an unforget unforgettable tour of America's strange flower-selling subculture. Along with the Seminole Indians who helped him and the forces of justice who fight him. In the end, Orlean and the reader will have more respect for the underdog determination and a powerful new definition of passion. Oh, oh, oh. Um, if you have heard about the Feather Thief, that's kind of what got me interested in this. It's like an art history heist. So I'm kind of thrilled to get to continue that whole thing. Ooh, let's move to some fiction. Okay, I have been hearing about this book for like so many years. And I found out that the reason why is because it's two decades old. And it's the only book this author has ever written. It's called The Lives of the Monster Dogs by Kirsten Backus. The description on it... Which also, can we just take a minute to appreciate this gorgeous cover? I mean, how cute is this? Okay, so the description says, After a century of cruel experimentation, genetically and biomechanically altered canines are produced by the followers of a 19th century Prussian surgeon. Possessing human intelligence, speaking human language, fitted with prosthetic hands, and walking upright, the monster dogs are intended to be super soldiers. Rebelling against their masters, however, and plundering the isolated village in which they were raised, the now wealthy creatures make their way to New York, where they become reluctant celebrities. Unable to reproduce, doomed to watch their race become extinct, the highly cultured dogs want nothing more than to live in peace, little suspecting that the real tragedy of their brief existence is only now beginning. Through diaries, newspaper clippings, and even an opera excerpt, Kristen Backus's, Kirsten Backus's award-winning Lives of the Monster Dogs uses its science fictional premise to launch a poignant exploration of great themes, loving, dying, and the limits of compassion. Ooh. Okay. Uh, we'll take a brief detour back to nonfiction. Um, and this kind of fits with... Uh, Lindsay Fitzharris's book, The Butchering Art, but it is, well, wait, here, it's got a long tagline, and I can't, I don't want to read backwards, so I'll show you the cover first. It is called The Invention of Murder, How the Victorians Reveled in Death and Detection and Created Modern Crime, and it is by Judith Flanders. It's a big old door stopper. Look at this thing. Um, so yeah, I've been on a true crime kick recently, and it was kind of the Victorians who invented the true crime genre. Uh, I mean, like, In Cold Blood took it to the next level, but it was a thing before Truman Capote got a hold of it. Okay, so the description on this one is... Murder in the 19th century was rare, but murder as sensation and entertainment became ubiqu ubiquitous, transformed into novels, into broadsides and ballads, into theater and melodrama and opera, even into puppet shows and performing dog acts. Detective fiction and the new police force developed in parallel, each imitating the other. The pioneers of Scotland Yard give gave rise to Dickens's Inspector Bucket, the first fictional police detective who in turn influenced Sherlock Holmes and ultimately even P.D. James and Patricia Cornwell. In this fascinating book, Judith Flanders retells the gruesome stories of many different types of murder, both famous and obscure, from the crimes and myths of Sweeney Todd and Jack the Ripper to the tragedies of the murdered Marr family in London's East End. Burke and Hare and their body snatching business in Edinburgh, 
and Greenacre, who transported his dismembered fiance around town by omnibus. With an irresistible cast of swindlers, forgers, and poisoners, the mad, the bad, and the dangerous to know, The Invention of Murder is both a gripping tale of crime and punishment and history at its most readable. Huh, so, uh, if y'all remember a while back on my blog, I talked about uh, my New Year's reading resolutions, and one of them was to read a bunch of big old nonfiction books, because like I tend to shy away from doorstoppers that are this long. But this one was interesting enough that I was like, okay, this is going to be one of my nonfiction doorstoppers. Okay, moving on to a much lighter note, nonfiction-wise. This one is called The Curse of the Boyfriend Sweater, Essays on Crafting by Alana Okun. And the description on this one, which, by the way, this just came out in paperback, so it's, it's pretty new. The description is, people who craft know things. They know how to transform piles of yarn into sweaters and scarves. They know that some items, like wool and bikini tops, are better left unknit. They know that making a hat for a newborn baby isn't just about crafting something small, but appreciating the beginnings of life, which sometimes helps make peace with endings. They know that if you knit your boyfriend a sweater, your relationship will most likely be over before the last stitch. In The Curse of the Boyfriend Sweater, Alana Okun lays herself bare and takes readers into the parts of themselves they often keep hidden. Yet, at the same time, she finds humor in the daily indignities all crafters must face, like when you catch the dreaded second sock syndrome and can't possibly finish the second in a pair, It is a must-read for anyone who has said to themselves or everyone within reach, I made that. So I just kind of recently-ish took up crafting. I mean, I like paper crafts and like the visible mending movement where you try to mend your clothes and embroidery. So I was like, all right, maybe this will inspire me because despite how much I enjoy crafting, I never seem to have enough time to do it. So I'm hoping that will get me going. All right. For the next one, this one technically doesn't come out until September. Wait, Amy says, LOL, I need this boyfriend sweater book. Oh, my God. Right. Okay. You're like the queen of crafting. Like, oh, my gosh. And you're so good. Uh, for those of y'all who don't know, uh, Amy makes amazing pottery and she paints it. It is beautiful. You should follow her on Instagram. It is a joy and a delight to see her work. Um, so this next one technically doesn't come out until September 3rd, but sometimes, uh, publicists will randomly send me books in the mail and it's always a surprise. And I mean, it's great when they're good. It's a little awkward when they're not great because then you have to tell the publicist like, mm, I don't think I'm going to review that, but uh, yeah, thanks for thinking of me. <laughs> this, so uh, this one, I think it's going to be really good. I've not started it yet, but it's called when death takes something from you, give it back. And it's by, uh, okay. She's Norwegian. So I'll probably mispronounce this, but I think it's, Naha Marie Ott, I think. I don't know. Don't quote me. Anyway, uh, the description, it is memoir, nonfiction. Uh, So the description says, in March 2015, Nadas Marie Ott's 25-year-old son Carl died in a tragic accident. When Death Takes Something From You, Give It Back chronicles the first few years after receiving that devastating phone call. It is at once a sober account of life after losing a child and an exploration of the language of poetry, loss, and love. Intensely moving and quietly devastating, when death takes something from you, give it back, explores what it is to be a family, what it is to love and lose, and what it is to treasure life in spite of death's indomitable resolve. So... I'll let you know closer to when it comes out what I think. But if you're real curious, you can pre-order it now. It's from Coffee House Press. All the rest of these are out. But this is the only one that has not come out yet. So surprise. Okay. Um, ooh, let's do some fiction. Okay. So 
This book is super random. I saw it like years ago and I didn't have money to buy it at the time and it stuck with me. So I thought when I was going on my book buying binge, I would get it. It's called Cat Out of Hell by Lynn Truss. And if you have cats, you know that all of them are actually from hell. That is their, like, if you know, when people are like, oh, where'd you adopt your cat from? You can say from hell and it will be accurate. <laughs> <laughs> I love them anyway, though. But yeah, so Lynn Truss is the author of Eat, Shoots, and Leaves, which is a hilarious grammar book. And this is like a totally different kind of book, which is kind of hilarious uh, and fascinating to see how authors like switch genres and mix things up. So this one, uh, definitely fiction. I think it's a mystery. Okay, the description is. For people who both love and hate cats comes the tale of Alec Charlesworth, a retired librarian whose beloved wife has just died. Bereft, he takes a lonely holiday where he becomes intrigued by a series of files concerning the mysterious disappearance of a woman artist. Files that include not only documents and images, but also audio interviews between a man called Wiggy and a cat called Roger. Yes, that's right. It takes a while for Alec to realize he's not gone mad from grief and that Roger is not only a talking cat, but a cat with a compelling tale to tell. A tale of dark forces that may even link to the death of Alec's wife. But, it is, Roger, but is Roger a good talking cat or an evil talking cat? With cats, unfortunately, isn't it hard to spot the difference? In the deft and comedic cans of mega bestseller Lynn Truss, Cat Out of Hell is an increasingly suspenseful and often hysterically funny adventure. And once it's over, as one critic noted, you may never look at a cat the same way again. Okay, so this one just honestly, it just cracked me up. And being the proud owner of three cats, I was like, okay. It's got to happen. It's coming home with me. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's do an essay collection. Okay, so this essay collection, like, probably eight different people have recommended it to me. And so I finally just <laughs> went ahead and got it because it's like when that many people recommend you a book, you just know you should read it. Uh, so, it is called The Wrong Way to Save Your Life by Megan Steelstra. And the description is, In this intellectually daring, viscerally intimate collection, Megan Steelstra interrogates her own fear in stories both personal and universal as she searches for a better way to live. The titular piece answers the question of what has value in our lives, which is no longer rhetorical when the Chicago apartment above her families bursts into flames. The essay, Here is My Heart, details her close relationship with her father, a big game hunter in Alaska who continues to climb mountains despite his heart problems, leading the author to dissect deer hearts and a poetic examination of mortality. Whether imagining the implications of open carry laws on college campuses, recounting the story of losing her first home during the recession, or shining a light on complexities of postpartum depression tangled with the fierce joys of motherhood, Steelstra's work informs, impels, and embraces us all. Sounds like she covers a lot of territory in this. There is that. And let's see. Oh, let's do some fiction. Okay, so for those of y'all who are local to Columbus, Ohio, uh, I got this book from my friend Charlie Pugsley, who runs Bookspace Columbus, which is a pop-up bookstore. Like, he travels around to different festivals and stuff and, like, sets up a table and sells books. It's really great. Um, and this one is called The Library at Mount Char by Scott Hawkins, and I found it uh, on one of Charlie's shelves, so, and he has really good taste, and being that it's a really tiny shop, he has to curate really well, so I tend to trust what he recommends. So here's the description on this one. 
Carolyn knows she's a little bit odd, but she figures that's only natural when she's spent her life locked away in an infinite library, forced to study at the feet of the man who might be God. She's seen her share of terrible things in those years, even died a few times herself. Steve tries hard to be an ordinary guy, and he's been doing a pretty good job at it until Carolyn shows up in his life with a tempting offer, a pair of red rubber galoshes, and exactly $327,000. Soon, he finds himself swept up in a war waged on a scale that he can barely comprehend as powerful forces battle for control of the library and the future of the universe itself. Brilliantly plotted, blackly funny, truly epic in scope, and featuring a cast of characters that includes a tutu-clad psychopath, a malevolent iceberg, and a lion named after an atomic bomb, the library at Mount Char is the year's most ambitious and acclaimed fantasy debut and a ride like you've never been on before. I'm also just a sucker for books about books. I mean, it's like, when you're a book nerd, I mean... (laughs) book nerd capitals letters here it's like how can you not love a book about books i mean it's like double whammy of goodness okay i got another nonfiction one here this one it's like i i'm i'm fascinated about like mansions in a weird way and also just like cool architecture so i found this one at the thrift store uh it is called well here's the cover Nice little gorgeous mansion on it. Wouldn't you love to live there? Uh, It's called Empty Mansions, The Mysterious Life of Huguette Clark and the Spending of a Great American Fortune. Sounds like rich people behaving badly. Let's find out. The description says, Empty Mansions is an enthralling mystery of wealth and loss and a secretive heiress named Huguette Clark. Though she owned palatial homes in California, New York, and Connecticut, why had she lived for 20 years in a simple hospital room despite being in excellent health? Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Bill Dedham has collaborated with Huguette Clark's cousin, Paul Clark Newell Jr., one of the few relatives to have frequent conversations with her. In a story that spans nearly all of American history in three generations, Dedman and Newell tell a fairy tale in reverse. The talented daughter, born into a family of fortune and privilege, who hides herself from the outside world. The authors reveal a complex portrait of the enigmatic Huguette and her intimate associates, including her extravagant father, her publicity-shy mother, her star-crossed sister, her French boyfriend, her nurse who received more than $30 million in gifts, and the relatives fighting to inherit Huguette's copper fortune. Empty Mansions is carefully drawn from conversations with Huguette, her personal papers, and the testimony of her inner circle. Updated with the outcome of the court battle for her estate and richly illustrated with more than 70 photographs, Empty Mansions is the story of an eccentric and highest order, a last jewel of the Gilded Age who lived life on her own terms. Like, weird, eccentric, rich people are oddly fascinating to me. So, we shall see. Uh, Okay, let's do some more fiction. Okay, this is one of those books that I'm pretty sure, like, everybody on the planet but me has read. It's A Darker Shade of Magic by V.E. Schwab. She was recently in town, and I was supposed to go with one of my friends, but my friend got sick, and I, and, like, I thought it would be weird if I, like, went by myself and waited in line for like six hours to get a book signed by an author who I'd never read anything by. I don't know. Maybe I should have gone, but I didn't, alas. But I got the book anyway. And here's the description. Welcome to gray London, dirty and boring, without any magic, with one mad king, George the Third. Then there's Red London, where life and magic are revered, and White London, a city slowly being drained through magical war, down to its very bones. And once upon a time, there was Black London, but no one speaks of that now. Officially, Kel is the Red Traveler, one of the last magicians who can travel between the worlds, acting as ambassador and messenger between the Londons, in service of the Maresh Empire. Unofficially, he's a smuggler, which is a dangerous hobby for him to have, 
as proved when Kel stumbles into a setup with a forbidden token from Black London. Fleeing into Grey London, Kel runs afoul of Delia Bard, a cut purse with the lofty aspirations, who first robs him, then saves him from a dangerous enemy, and then forces Kel to spirit her into another world for a proper adventure. But perilous magic is afoot, and treachery lurks at every turn. To save all the worlds, they'll first need to stay alive. Okay, can I just say that, like, this one hits all my buttons because it has several of my favorite words and phrases just in the ti- like in the description. Runs afoul of is probably one of my favorite phrases ever. Uh, and then perilous magic and treachery. It's like the only other thing you can do to like make this more me is put in an art heist in a library and I'm good. <laughs> Okay, so the next book, oh, let's do the only hardcover in this bunch. It is called All You Can Ever Know, a memoir, and it is by Nicole Chung, who, uh, if you're a writer on Twitter, I highly recommend following. But, so this one, the description is, what does it mean to lose your roots within your culture, within your family, and what happens when you find them? Nicole Chung was born severely premature, placed for adoption by her Korean parents, and raised by a white family in a sheltered Oregon town. From childhood, she heard the story of her adoption as a comforting prepackaged myth. She believed that her biological parents had made the ultimate sacrifice in hope of giving her a better life, that forever feeling slightly out of place was her, feet, was her fate as a transracial adoptee. But as Nicole grew up, facing prejudice her adoptive family couldn't see, finding her identity as an Asian American and as a writer, becoming ever more curious about where she came from, she wondered if the story she'd been told was the whole truth. With warmth, candor, and startling insight, Nicole Chung tells of her search for the people who gave her up, which coincided with the birth of her own child. All You Can Ever Know is a profound, moving chronicle of surprising connections and the repercussions of unearthing painful family secrets. Vital reading for anyone who has ever struggled to figure out where they belong. I love me a good book about family secrets. I just can't help myself. Okay, I have two more. Um, So this one is We Were Witches, a novel by Ariel Gore. And uh, Cat on the Cover... How on brand is that? Because, like, uh, three of these books are about cats. <laughs> okay, so this one, the description says, Caught in the crossfire of the culture world wars and spurred on by the 90s family values campaigns, teen mom Ariel is determined to better herself through education, taking on an enormous debt to go to college. Ariel wants more than mere survival. She wants to be a writer. But the overabundance of phallocentric narratives in college threatens to sink her dream. Amid trips to family court and messy encounters with her various exes, Ariel seeks guidance from a multitude of spirit feminists, from Tilly Olson to Audre Lorde to Gloria Anzaludia. Riley riffing on feminist and literary tropes, We Were Witches documents the life and times of a demonized single mother as she figures out her magic. Uh, also, when I did the air quotes, it was actually stuff that was had quotation marks around it in the description. And also, this one is by the lovely Feminist Press. Uh, so it will be a fantastic feminist read, I'm sure. I've never disliked anything they've published except for one thing, and I won't tell you what it is because I don't like to speak ill of books. I just like to tell you the ones I do like. And lastly, the largest and heaviest and only graphic novel of the bunch, Palestine by Joe Seiko. And he's fascinating to me because he kind of invented the genre of, like, graphic journalism. So, like, he does comics but he's like an an award-winning journalist and a super brilliant and i find this fascinating also fun fact i myself am half palestinian so i thought this would be cool to read all right so the description on this one says 
In the early 90s, Joe Seiko spent two months with Palestinians in the occupied territories, traveling and taking notes. The result was the comic book series Palestine, which combined the techniques of eyewitness reportage with the medium of comic book storytelling to explore a complex, emotionally weighty situation. The first collected edition won a 1996 American Book Award and single-handedly created a new genre, graphic journalism. It remains a perennial classic and a landmark work of both comics and journalism. So that is that. All right. Uh, so when you pile all of these books up, one on top of the other, I just realized it's about two feet tall. It nearly comes up to my knee. Uh, so that ought to keep me busy for a good long while. And what's weird is I can't help but thinking that I've actually got one or two more that are hiding somewhere around the house and maybe on my nightstand that I'm just forgetting about. But all of these were acquired within the past two weeks. And that's a lot of books to rack up in two weeks. So I hope all of this was fun. Hope you learned about some books that you're interested in. I hope I have not bored you to tears. If you like this, let me know. Leave a comment. I can do some more. Uh, if you want to see more lives, if you like my pretty face, <laughs> let me know. I'm trying to make this group more engaging, and so I, need, I want to know what y'all like. Okay, let me know. Bye, and have a happy weekend. Happy reading.